Okay. We are live. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Michael. All right. So we just exchanged it, exchanged a fabricated hello there because we were just chatting off stream. Um, you have been doing a series of dispatches from Portland. I had assumed that you live there, which you do not currently, but you have yep. Yep. in the past. Um, why did why did you make the special effort to fly across the country to observe a fiasco of a protest like this? Uh, well, I'm a journalist, and you know half my friends are journalists, and uh, these are really you know smart people that work for you know great publications, Reason and Vice, and they're like, what the hell is going on in Portland, Nancy? I can't I can't get a handle on it. And these are people that like they know how to get a handle on stuff. They know how to read around and, and get an idea. And I, you know, I think as you know, and as you've written so brilliantly, you know, there's, there were two stories coming out of Portland. And one story was um, peaceful protesters, terrible feds. And the other story was, um, you know, anarchists burning down entire city. And I knew that neither of those things were the case. And I also knew the city and I have, you know, watch the city. I moved there in 2004, moved out last year. I really had seen the sort of, um, I'd seen Portland getting primed for exactly where it is. So um, I texted my editor at Reason and said, I want to go. She said, go. So is I did. That, uh, Catherine? Yeah, who's great. And I'm going back tomorrow. I'm going back for a week tomorrow. So um, anybody that wants to, uh, my DMs are open um, because it's changed, but it continues. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back and keep reporting for a while. Yeah, well, God bless you. I don't know that I'd be <laughs> necessarily motivated <laughs> to go back at this point. Um, but, you know, I had spent two months on the road. So I, I know. drove there cross country. That wasn't intended to be my ultimate destination initially. But like you mentioned, there was a point, I want to say, I guess in early to mid July when you hit a light bill saying, wait a second, what the heck is going on in Portland? Yep. I even asked that to myself uh, uh, at one point I can kind of recall because there had been so much else going on all over the country sure. that I was sort of peripherally aware that there was something sort of unique happening in Portland, but I hadn't delved into the intricacies of the, the details right. at all. But then I guess it, it escalated and it, when it sort of burst into the national consciousness, you had a lot of people asking, like including seasoned journalists who would ordinarily not have a hard, especially hard time getting a handle on things, especially protests. It's not like you could just go to the protests and, and look at it, right? But people were still almost uh, baffled by it. Uh, so I said, you know what? I happen to be in roughly the, 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 I mean, when I was, I guess I was in Seattle when it really, uh, broke out as a story and I had been more or less planning on going to Portland anyway. Uh, but then I, I knew I was going to have to go. You so. and I were there at the same time because yeah, I figured that out actually, yeah. when you sent, you sent me one of your dispatchers, like I was there that night. I didn't yeah, see and a, her though. A bunch of my friends are like, yeah, you should look for Michael Tracy. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be super easy. There's only, you know, like 8,000 people and it's dark. So I'm sure yeah. I'm going to run into him. So, uh, yeah. And everybody's because, wearing masks and looks like yeah, semi -anonymous. exactly. And, it's, and you're getting tear gassed. So, yeah, I, I didn't yeah. have any uh, hopes of actually running into you there. But, yeah, we were there pretty much the same time, I think. Um, well, we must have been because that was the night I happened to get there the night that Ted Wheeler, the mayor, okay. should made an appearance. That was my yeah. first night there. Yeah, I was. Um, that was my third or fourth night there, and I, I only stayed a couple of days after that. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. did you get? Were, did you consume tear gas that night? <laughs> a lot. Um, yeah. I had I had gotten gassed a couple nights before, um, just one time, and I happened to be with a photographer who had pretty bad asthma, and she had to get the hell out of there. And it was already like two thirty in the morning, so we we split. But you know, it wasn't fun. But the second time, the the Wheeler night, um, I was by myself, and uh. I got it five times and it was, you know, it's heavy duty stuff. It's this military grade CS gas, whatever that stands for. And uh, I had no intention of leaving. Like I'd get gassed, I'd run into the park, I'd kind of <laughs> snot up my mask and clean up and then go back and report. And the after the fifth time, my body started walking itself to the car. Like I had no intention of going. My body's like, okay, that's it. You're done. You're done. It was, you know, it's so your conscious brain shut off. At a certain I, point. Yeah, and the body just was walking. I was like, okay, I guess that's it for the night. So yeah, yeah, you know, I hadn't 
planned on getting tear gas if one does yeah. plan on that. I was sort of following around Ted Wheeler. Oh, you were right next to him. I was close to him when he decided to subject himself to tear gas in a kind of bizarre choreographed stunt where he brings this guy, Mike Baker of the New York Times. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, a friend of mine's like, did not trust his reporting. Well, I mean, I don't know if I trust it or not, but <laughs> I do know that it was pretty clearly chore choreographed where this guy, this New York Times reporter just happens to be right next to him, snapping all, you know, the most vivid photos and videos possible of Ted Wheeler being tear gassed um, at just the right, the, the, just the opportune moment. Wow. Imagine that, Michael. Just imagine that. Imagine what a that. coincidence. It must yeah. have just been an amazing coincidence. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well. But I was I was sort of because I had I had asked Ted Wheeler a question at one point and then I was confronted by protesters who were offended by right. Right. my line of questioning and I just kind of trailed him for a little while after that and I don't know I guess I just wasn't really expecting to get a massive deluge of tear well, gas but I was and I had to like it was it was bad I mean it was no it, painful. it's it's bad and you know you're you do it repeatedly and repeatedly I was wearing a little cloth mask um and I mean I saw guys vomiting it's you know it's it's heavy duty stuff um I, I, so, I like kind I did kind of I kind of uh gagged or I didn't yeah. like, actually vomit out my lunch that, that day or, or anything but I did have I had a vomitous reaction so you were so Wheeler was in front of Justice Center that's where he was set up under that big uh you know the bat the everything uh Against it the was wall. It was interesting because when I was attempting to communicate with him, I got like one sentence from him before I was interrupted, but that sentence was sufficient, actually. That was in the, the piece that you read. Um, it's a brilliant piece. It's oh, just, thank you. It, it really, like, I wrote a lot of pieces and they kind of fit together, and that's cool. Yours was just this nice chunk of yes. It's really good. Thanks. Thanks. Really I appreciate good. that. People can go Google that, Google Michael Tracy yeah. and Heard Portland or something. Um, I'll put it in the description box of this video. Yeah. I'll put, put one, one or two of their pieces. Um, but one thing I didn't put in the piece from that exchange, where and you could hear it in the YouTube version that I posted on my channel, is that you know people Ted Wheeler was being berated the entire yeah. time he was there. Oh, yeah. I mean, people yeah, really yeah. disliked him. Although the tide of the crowds, well, were you there when he addressed the crowd? I actually came up while he was addressing the crowd. I came and kind of got there late that night, like 1030. And he was talking. But of course, you know, they were just screaming over him. You know, Wheeler sucks. Fed okay, so I was everything. like, I was like, I was up there on the. Oh, on the podium. There. Or, the podium okay. like, close to him on the podium. Okay. Um, and the MC, who was like one of the relatively few black people there. Yep. But they, yep. He gets appointed as the voice to be elevated yep. to address the crowd. To, you know, to whose voice must be centered. Um, he was sort of imploring the crowd to let Ted Wheeler speak, even though he was a, he was a white man. So in any other circumstance, he wouldn't be speaking, right? He had to get the authorization from the black MCs. And there was a point at which Ted Wheeler was denouncing the federal forces mm -hmm. yep. and saying that it was uh, abhorrent what they were doing. And I think he condemned Trump. And he, the, the crowd did like express a little bit of approval of him collectively at one point, which was, was a little bit surprising. Little. A I little was bit. actually there when uh, the MC, whose name I, I don't know, um, was saying, hey, you know, hey, crowd, maybe yeah, you want to just like about. listen just for a minute. And they were not, they were not having it. You know, it's mm -hmm. the. Many of them were not, but there was like there was like a, a, a sweet spot of a moment where you can get where they could have gotten like a thirty second clip of him eliciting something that resembled approval from the crowd. Okay, he, when he was like sort of denouncing the federal physics. But the point the point is like in my exchange with him, one of the people who came up to berate him was saying, "Ted, you go to the front lines, and you get gassed." And he was like, "Okay, yes, I will do that. I shall do that." He, he said that. And that's when I, I don't know if he decided in that moment to do it or if it was choreographed earlier. Uh, I mean, he had the heavy duty gas mask that you would need to withstand that. Um, but I don't know. But like you can you can hear in that audio that I posted him agreeing to go get tear gas. So question. So for your 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 viewers here. So there's the Justice Center, which is the big like cop shop and the jail is in there. I wrote the piece about the woman that got 
in the basement when they set fire to it. And then next door is the federal building. And the federal building is where the feds were shooting the tear gas out of. So did Wheeler actually walk from, I mean, it's only separated by a street. They're basically next to each other. But did he move from that podium over to the federal building to get gassed? Because as far as I know, they were not gassing right in front of Justice Center where he had been speaking. Well, what happened was after he was finished speaking, he was then going and conducting what he called the listening session. So he was walking around and just taking questions from the general public, mm. at which point I decided to seize upon that opportunity and ask him a question, which the protesters did not appreciate because I was erasing their voices. Um, but eventually he milled over, he did mill over, like he was kind of just meandering around and then he did make his way over to the federal building. So he crossed yeah. the street. Well, that must have been the first volley of tear gas because he amscrated, I think, pretty you know quickly after that. Um, so speaking of you, Michael Tracy, and I'm sure your viewers have watched it. I watched that video of you getting your um, your phone taken and listening to them screaming. This app's list, you know, sloganeering and screaming, and um, and then watching you run. And I wanted to mention is first of all, it reminded me of that old uh, Orson Welles film, Touch of Evil, where like the streets are completely empty. It was kind of a phenomena around the uh, around the protests. Like you go two blocks and it was barren. Yeah. Did you know? I mean, frighteningly empty. And you, yeah. because like you can't like you can't drive freely. I mean, there's not. There was like one guy who like once I was once I ran away and like felt that I was far away enough to sort of regroup yeah. and yeah. reestablish myself and figure out how to get to my car. Um, I know we're there was like, Street. Yeah, there was like one. Yeah, yeah, that was it. There was one guy. Okay, I'm filming now. I can't get my maps open, so I'll just ask this random guy who happens to be here on these otherwise barren streets, if he knows where the hell Salmon Street is. Where's my car? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I found it pretty soon. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it is sort of eerie. Uh, in, in it the, was, in it was area. I mean, Manhattan can be that way too. I've walked from my friend's house on 56th all the way down Chinatown, like down 5th, and you'll see like three people at two in the morning. But the the when there were like 8,000 people congregated there and three blocks away, there was nothing. It was, it was eerie. It was a little strange. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. That was a, that was a wholesome experience. Family, mm -hmm. family fun. Family friendly. Yeah. Family friendly. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but you know, I mean, that, that's why, I mean, I, I don't like to, I mean, I knew right away when I publicized what occurred there, it was automatically going to be construed by some is me trying to make myself out to be a victim or make myself the story. Well, there's just, I knew that there's going to be an inevitable backlash just by dint of me saying what happened. But I tried to do it as neutrally as possible, and just relaying the facts. But of course, you know, that was a reaction. And they, you know, I got accused of being an, an instigator. And I still get trolls saying that now. Oh, it's yeah. Like, instigator, really, by walking around with a phone out? And when there are people filming, I mean, there, and you, you, you could attest to this, right? There's people out there every two steps. Everybody has their phone out. Okay, everybody has their phone out. And then you've got the people, uh, tons and tons of people that are press. Like they've got a hat. They put like white adhesive tape that it says press or a little. I mean, I'm press. I don't wear something that says press. I'm sure you don't wear I something don't either, that says no. press. Um, but you know. I find it obnoxious actually. It, 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 it is. I mean, I, I mean, I guess there's this like, I don't know, green vest thing that the ACLU, whatever. I never have done that, except like occasionally when you need to like walk in and it's a secure area and then you're like, okay, press, I'm in. Yeah, if you have to get but, to like if some kind of official event where right, there's no choice. Like murder or something, right? Um, but, um, you know, there, it's obviously, it's an identity that they are having. Also in Portland, um, they've passed certain things and, and re-upped it when the feds were there. Like, you know, if you're press, you got to be able to watch and you got to be able to view. So, you know, they're all press then, right? But you and I, when we're there and I've just got like my pad out or I'm like taking a little picture, I had, you know, two kids, like 20. I have no idea if they're black block, if they're LARPing, if they're, if they're Antifa, they're like, photography equals death. And I'm like, they said that. I literally said, First of all, I'm a journalist. Second of all, shut the fuck up. <laughs> third, third, explain that I might have said shut the fuck up. Third, I actually said to them, 
explain to me what you mean. Like nothing. They can't. And then I just, I, then I got a little, I was getting a little mouthy because I'd been gassed three times and I was like, no, you're going to explain to me what you're talking. Now they just wandered off into the crowd. But, yeah. um, people yeah, they were, don't. People were criticizing me because like, in, in the in that little uh, exchange, but right before my phone gets smashed, when the, the guy with the the Antifa soldier with the shield and the anarchist yep, logo yep. emblazoned on it, that commands me to turn to stop filming, and I say no. And the other guy says, "Oh, you fucking pussy!" And I was just like, "Fuck you!" And yeah. people people criticize me for saying "fuck you" in reply. It's just like, "Oh, you're not a journalist because you said fuck you." It's like, I mean, fundamentally, I'm just a human and a and a citizen here. So like, I'm not gonna. Also, doing journalistic activity doesn't necessitate that I like turn off other all my other human faculties, you know, right? Right. So people kind of like, I, I mean, know, people impart the concept of journalism with this idealized standard that doesn't even exist. I would say, I mean, in almost every part of my journalistic life, except if I'm sitting with my friends at a bar, I do not go around saying, oh, you know, fuck you. I mean, no, neither do I. It doesn't come up. But when you are in a crowd of, you know, a thousand people, uh, it's really hot, meaning violent hot. Everybody's, you know, smacking stuff around. There's fireworks. You're getting pushed. And you're getting also like, I mean, I've been pushed around a little by these folks before. And uh, I don't know. It's like, you're 20 and you can't explain to me why you're saying what you're saying. Sorry. We're not, I mean, I would happily, and I'm coming back on Thursday, kids, I will happily interview them because I really do want to get underneath the nub of what's going on here. I'm not really sure there is an under the nub for some of these kids. They're pretty young. But if you're just going to come in my face and start shouting in my face or grabbing my stuff, sorry, no. Yeah. I'm not going to roll over and be like, Oh no! I must just be here as the observer. Ah. Uh -uh. Yeah, you no. have to be this like gentle, uh, accommodating, yeah, you know, objective. friend or something. No, no so just, and that's yeah. that, that's also that also happened when I was in, and by the way, I spent two months across the United States, including at many protests, many po post riot zones, and only in Portland did it ever escalate remotely to the point where I was in a position of having to say "fuck you." I mean, most well, of the time, I get along with everybody. I can't remember that ha actually ever, almost happening ever before. Except with cops occasionally, um, but you know, in Portland, there's no cop. I mean, in that no. immediate area, there's no, no cops except for the, the. At least when I was there, it was just the feds. No. I mean, there's None. no Portland Police Bureau. There's no. Really. I found some hiding that actually I quoted right. in that piece. Right. Um. Uh. But 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 yeah, I mean, there's this. I was asking a question of, a, of the mayor, a public elected official. And I get interrupted, shouted down, called a white supremacist for asking about like a pandemic, really? So yeah, I'm gonna take the initiative. <laughs> I mean, if I'm if you put me in that position, I'm, I reserve the right to tell you to fuck off, and you deserve it. They so you know I am, and I'm I'm sure you know this as a journalist. People want to tell you their stories, even even you know even people that claim that they don't. They really do. They want to they want to tell you if you can kind of get them one on one. You get it more quiet. They'll talk to you. But, you know, these are, for the most part, pretty young people. Uh, and Antifa, uh, you know, which previously I sort of just associated with sort of anarchy, um, really has, and I put this in one of my pieces, there's a sort of a vanillifying of it in, um, in Portland. It grows into a wider and wider band um, that incorporates or can incorporate a lot of people. Some of it is organized. A lot of it isn't. Um, this is, you know, I'm not an expert here. These are my observations. Um, but, you know, Antifa doesn't want to be photographed. That's like a bedrock thing. And so they're just like, they're just going to get in your face if you do it. And they also have, they have a lot of energy right now. They have a lot of momentum. Uh, I don't know that they have a solid plan for when they do, or if they do, you know, burn down a police station or if, or if city hall is next. However, having said that, and now, you know, things are for your listeners and viewers, you know, things are cooler there. The feds are gone and, and, and we're well, not gone. They're just less. They're, not gone. they're, they're much less. And, and that, and then what happened is that there were still two narratives coming out of Portland. 
both being, you know, there's a black and a white. And it's like, oh, look, the feds are gone. Just like we said, everything's yeah. nice now in Portland. Yeah. Because so the whole was thing was just, actually, it was, it was all was Trump's fault. Yeah. All Trump's fault. And the second part is the city's still on fire and they're going to be like, you know, burning down all the cop stations. Well, it's neither of these things are exactly true. But what I, I do think is true is that when you have people and it's a growing band of people again that has a lot of um sort of support and sympathy from the community like like the 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 edges between the really kind of violent hooliganism and the peaceful protest it it, it gets a little starts to mingle a little bit um so they've got a lot of support they've got a lot of energy what do you do with this energy when like your main enemy, the feds in the, in the federal building are gone? Well, it's going to go somewhere. It doesn't calm down. So now it's the cop shops and it's citizens. And it's this sweet little neighborhood in uh, North Portland that I think I'm going to write about called Kenton, where, you know, these were not the peaceful protesters. These were people that want to tear shit down and burn shit down. This neighborhood, it just like, redone its little main street, you know, COVID was so hard and now we're going to have it, we're going to make it super nice. They raised money in mid-July and it had just opened and boom, swept through, took all the tables, the chairs, set them on fire, broke windows, graffiti this was, stuff. Was this recently? This was on Sunday night. Okay. So it's like- Yeah, my favorite little anecdote, maybe not my favorite, but one of my favorite pieces of information that I put in that piece was that Protesters decided to randomly smash the windows of the Voodoo Donut shop. Yeah. yeah, it's just like okay, it's not the end of the world, but you'd think people would be interested in just knowing that and, and, and making that part of the narrative. Okay, if you have a, somebody who's like a big gay security guard telling me that, yeah, you know, the protesters came by, the BLM protesters came by. That's how we put it last night and just smashed up the shop. So we had to board everything up. Just like okay, I mean, that's interesting. Why don't we know that? Why is it? Why does it fall to me, some guy well, who's not even from Portland, to okay. report that? Like, what? Where's the Portland Mercury? You know? Well, okay. First of all, I mean, they're all, they're all, they're all now like. We start. Yeah. Um, okay, so the thing is that you know, the again, media's in bed with it. Pretty we much. go back to we go back. And, and to the before I forget, before sure. I forget, you you mentioned uh, the vanilla fine yeah. of Antifa vis-a-vis yeah. Portland. That concept is very interesting to me. I tried to get. To a little bit of that in the piece where you have like the meshing of insurrectionary radical anarchism with almost normy democrat style can, stuff can you think of more catnip than telling a middle class middle-aged woman in portland hey just put on a yellow shirt come down here and protect these people from these terrible federal officers i mean it's from like, trump Oh my God! It's like, me, you know, I like will Rachel Maddow do wants it. you to go down, you know? right? Um, which, of course, that whole thing completely imploded. Though I read an interesting piece about that today. Um, oh, but again, oh, getting back to the 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 narratives, like, why are you the person telling it? Why am I the person telling it? Because people have their, you know, whether they have a mandate from their paper to report things a certain way, whether they're a true believer, whether their readers want their you know, bias is confirmed. They want that sweet song. A friend of mine who was out there the other day, she's a photographer. She was watching it get really hot at the cop shop out on the east side. And there were three journalists there and they'd been uh, journalists. I don't know if they were real press. I don't know if, I, I don't know, I wasn't there. But they were like madly scribbling and filming and doing everything. And as soon as the attack started, put their hands down, put their hands down, put their pads down, put their phones down. So it's not what their readers want. They want to continue hearing that um, that it's, you know, peaceful. And if it gets a little hot, well, we have to understand that emotions are running high. And I do understand that. And I do understand that, you know, mobs make it get hotter and people do things when they're in a mob that they'd never do on their own. And I get all of that. But you and I both walked in there with our eyeballs open and reported what we saw and shot it. And I defy anybody to look at what I shot and say, if that was your mother's house, that's peaceful. Yeah, I mean, it's simply not peaceful. It drives me crazy. I mean, if you want to declare your support, 
for what's happening in Portland, and you can apply this to elsewhere in the country, right? Just don't lie about it. Don't dissemble and obfuscate. That is what makes me crazy. I mean, like, uh, there's a you could put forward a coherent argument in favor of this, given that you believe the country is being controlled, you know, is being has been overtaken by fascists, and all tactics are warranted to stand up to that, whatever, whatever the argument might be, it's, you, you could conceive of an argument that at least makes sense, even if you might, I might, or you might not agree with it. But instead they resort to these almost propagandistic tactics where over and over again, you hear the mantra peaceful protests. And it's just like, no, what happens in Portland from 10 a.m. to 2 uh, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., at least when I was there, it's, it's not peaceful. Arson attacks are not peaceful. They're not. And, and the thing is, threatening to stomp me the fuck out and essentially kill me is not peaceful. Right? No, and I, I think that, you know, I hate to have to do the throat clearing and say, yeah, a lot of it is peaceful because, yeah, a lot of it is peaceful. Like, okay, yeah. guys, we have established that. We have established that the majority of the people out there marching for Black Lives Matter and, and other, you know, causes and, you know, against police brutality. Yes, that is. But we are talking about something that also exists and then the sort of blurring of these two things so you can tell me all you want that that too is peaceful it's not you can uh, you did you see what happened today what the da put out the new da i saw something about it but i didn't look that right into so it. he's kind of an interesting guy like um my more kind of conservative friends were like, oh my God, can you believe he's doing this? And then, you know, the more pro Antifa guys are like, yeah, I'm going to abolish everything. He's really not. He seems a little more kind of middle of the road. He wants to make some good changes, but basically um, relating to the rioters, uh, most of the cases uh, arrests are going to be sort of expunged. Um, uh, like, if it's interference with a police officer, disorderly conduct, criminal trespass, escape three, or harassment or rioting, those are all gone. You can't get arrested for that. And if you were, it's gone. You still can get, you know, if you commit real violence, if you, you know, do this, uh, if you, if you uh, like steal something or destroy something for more than a thousand dollars, criminal mischief, you will then go into restitution. You won't be arrested. You'll you'll make amends for it and you'll pay for it. Um, uh, it's, hmm, it's part of a swelling that Portland wants. Um, I mean, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the things that he proposes are things that I think are interesting. Like, is, this, is, this, is, he the, is he currently the DA? So what happened was he, he ran- running for no, something. He ran for DA. And he won back in May, he got 77% of the vote. But the guy that was in there already, whose name I'm spacing on, was supposed to serve through the end of the year. But he basically said to the new guy, I, I do not have the tools or, it would not be fair for me to continue dealing with what's going on in Portland and then handing it off to you, I'm, I'm dipping. He left. So the guy who thought he had six months to prepare is now thrown in. He's got some interesting ideas. Like he wants to get rid of the death penalty. He wants to, um, you know, make the first two drug charges you get, like you're not arrested, you go get treatment. Like these are cool things. These are good ideas. But he's also making kind of special exceptions for the rioters. This gets a little slippery, right? You mm -hmm. also have, um, talking about the vanillifying of uh, Antifa, you've got Ted Wheeler, who, if he can be more unpopular, I, I don't know how that will happen, though I wonder if some people are just vocally unpopular, but secretly they're like, I don't know, maybe I want the guy to stay, I don't know. But you have the first openly pro-Antifa um, uh, mayoral candidate running against him, Sarah Ian Aroni. and uh, I love that. Yeah, she strikes me as... Um, she strikes me as electable, first of all. Um, she strikes me as um, very sympathetic to everything that's going on in Portland. And also, okay, so the movement right now doesn't really have a figurehead, right? So you need a figurehead. It strikes me that she could be a figurehead, but there would be other people behind the curtain um, pulling the levers. Yeah, so. I mean, if, if Antifa, quote unquote, can get a, 
candidate elected mayor, then that would be the ultimate kind of culmination <laughs> of the vanillifying, right? Because but she's the, she's been running for a while. I, I covered a uh, Proud Boys um, Antifa kind of rally rally. It was basically a whatever. A th street theater? Yeah, street theater. Last year for a reason. Um, but uh, she was running for mayor then. And uh, same thing. She People can go follow her and see what she says. Um, she is a middle-class white woman living in Portland. You know, she's she's not like a, you know, kind of, you know, Joan Jett looking kind of I think, I, think, yeah. I, think, I think middle class white women are the most radicalized demographic in American society. Well, right they, now. You know, they, well, they like, like, compared to where they were like five years ago. Now, like your average middle, like if I were, were to run into a middle class white woman in, in, Portland, in Portland, I would assume that she was like vaguely pro Antifa and yeah. believes well, that we're living under fascism, you, et cetera. You can be, you know, you can be the maybe the radical you sort of dreamed of, or you know, the ideals that a lot of them that you, you know, you you believe the sweet song, the good ideals of this, right? Whether it's you know systemic racism or you know better housing, like the, this is a sweet song to you. And the other stuff, well, you don't really know if it's true. You're not down there, and uh, they feel like they can, you know, maybe be like have a little bit of that radical identity while still, you know, driving the kids to school and just, you know, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's like the whole, it's like, it's like a continuation of the pussy hat phenomenon oh, where like that yeah. made you, that was like some sort of radical gesture in their minds to wear a pink wool knit cap that looked like a pussy in opposition to the government, I guess. Like that was their, that was their idea. Uh, to them, it seemed like a radical political stance. Well, and it really took I mean, so much work, right? Just put on a hat, just put on a yellow shirt. Everything's taken care of. It's like, this is not, this is, these are not ideas. Okay. These are not ideas. These are not things that are going to make any kind of change that are going to, that's going to be interesting. Okay. Yeah, so, so speaking of the vanillifying, um, I don't know if you noticed, but I, I titled this video from Portland to Kamala or from Kamala to Portland, part, part just, just sort of as a tease to get people to watch because Oh, from this Kamala. one? This video, oh, the, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, this from was, Portland to Ka Ka from Kamala. Kamala to Portland or from Kamala. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Whatever. Don't you because usually have like the little comments over here that are scrolling down? I don't see. Yeah, them. I guess you don't see them, which is That's probably fine. better. Because That's fine. You don't are they saying them. nasty things? Uh, I mean, some of them are, not, are good. <laughs> like, I try not to pay too close attention to them because they're distracting. People enjoy when we acknowledge them because that places them to uh, to go no, sure. more wild. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you really want to see them, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. But I don't recommend it. Um, okay, so I did that sort of as, as tongue in cheek, but the, I, I'm going to be writing on this uh, probably for next week because I'm I semi took a semi taking like a week or so off here, even though I'm doing streams nightly, it seems. Um, but at this uh, oversight hearing last week uh, in the Senate where I happen to be quoted by Ron Johnson, who's the chairman oh. of this subcommittee that deals with the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security. Um, people were sending me messages informing me that I got quoted by Ron Johnson in this meeting. Actually, it was a different unheard piece, believe it or not. I don't know how, you know, so some of the staff apparently sent it to him. Um, Kamala is a member of this committee. So she was questioning Chad Wolf, who's the acting mm -hmm. director of yep, Department yep. of Homeland Security. Yep. Something that does seem to be true about Trump's the Trump administration is that Trump like doesn't even bother to get department heads confirmed by the full Senate. So he has like a ton of acting directors, including this guy who's like has a pretty high profile role right now in terms of the Department of Homeland Security and the level of interest involved in, you know, who what fat forces he's deploying where and such. But he's not Senate confirmed, but he was there for an oversight hearing. And Cobb, when it was Kamala's turn. Yeah, you know, she did the whole routine of essentially saying, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, I should have got sure. the exact quote, but it was like, how dare you demonize these peaceful protesters? Like, that was her line, effectively. And talk about vanillifying, right? I mean, this is Kamala Harris, the former quote unquote right. top cop, self described top cop of the largest state in the union, who's now the vice presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. Almost like 
uh, uh, planting her flag in the cause of the Portland insurrectionary anarchists who run around chanting ACAB, all cops are bastards. I know, I know. So, like, you can't be a good cop in that framework. Like, you can't no. be, like, I, I, I relate an anecdote in that the Portland Unheard piece about uh, a woman who's in the Portland Police Bureau is a black lesbian woman. Yep, yep, yep. Because yep. the Portland Police it. Department, you know, they, they, they consciously undertook an initiative to diversify their ranks over the past 20, 25 years. Um, as did, has had many big police, big city police departments now, which kind of gets lost in the popular furor around police departments. I mean, Carmen Best, the police chief of Seattle, who was just forced out, is herself a black woman in a, in a, you know, in a, in a largely white uh, city. I don't know what the exact demographics are in, in Seattle, but more so, it's more white than most big cities. Yeah, yeah, um, as is Portland, obviously. Well, yeah, and Portland is overwhelmingly white. Um, and so for Kamala Harris, I mean, for Kamala Harris not to even apparently be aware that there's well, some tension in her declaring her you know, solidarity with insurrectionary anarchists who say all cops are bastards and reform is impossible uh, given the, the system is fundamentally racist and white supremacist and fascist is like, is a tension that seems like very few people are interested in even exploring. Okay, so I don't know um, who gives Kamala Harris her information. Um, I do know, you know, if you only watch CNN and read the New York Times, um, you're going to see it this way. If you only, you know, watch Fox and, you know, whatever other, you know, Daily Caller, you're going to see things, you know, they're, they're, they're in their lanes. Now, we would want a Kamala Harris to be broader than that, right? We would say, look, it's your job. Like, it's your job to actually know. But maybe she doesn't know. I don't, maybe there's so much, um, you know, vilification of, uh, you know, these, these federal forces, which, let's be frank, they were not rolled out particularly well because... Trump's going to Trump. It's not, it's not like it was super seamless, but then again, it's like, how do you do something like this super seamlessly? Right. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, so, I mean if, if, if you do think that it's the prerogative of the federal government to see to it, that the courthouse is not burned down. I, I and something okay. I guess probably had to be done. Right? I, I I'm not just, I'm not, I'm not saying it's good, but here's it, the thing, Portland, you know, for a number of years, and this is how we started this conversation, has been um, at war with its own police force, has, you know, been taking away certain powers, has a very vocal, I mean, Portlanders love to march. My goodness, after Trump was elected, they they marched every day. There were marches for like four months. Yeah. Um, There's like a culture of perpetual protest there. It's a, Yes, I mean, because it's just, it's perpetual protest, I, you know, for, for, everything and, and you know anything anything that can possibly be against Trump then they're they're for it right um I wasn't there at the time I do know that Justice Center was getting Justice Center which is next door to the federal building where the cops are was getting beat up every night um they set fire to it there were employees there there were prisoners there I wrote a piece about that for a reason what it was like to be like in the basement while she's watching on the news everything on fire on top of her. I mean, this is really terrible. Were you, you were in the basement? I was not there. No, I wrote an article about a woman who works there. She oh, works okay, and, okay. and she, you know, they're, they're setting fire. It was, it was May 29th. It was the second or third night of the protests. Uh, and they, you know, they smashed all the windows. They threw the furniture around, they set it on fire and she was in the basement and she's watching this on the news and her friends are texting her madly like, Oh my God. Meanwhile, like, and this, outside, is some, this is some like clerical worker or who, she who actually, that, she works um, sort of like doing intake for prisoners and stuff. Okay, and also yeah. the prisoners in the building that they're guarding. I mean, you're shouting about how black lives matter. Well, guess what? There's a whole bunch of black lives in that building that you're trying to burn down. And then you hear like oh, this really, Oh man. Ooh, I got steamed two days ago. A guy who's been doing some I thought some pretty comprehensive work in Portland and I'd actually like linked a big series, something about what he wrote on the ground. Then he wrote about that cop Who shop that there. Uh, what is it? Robert Evans wrote Bell. He writes uh, for Bell. Yeah, that guy. Well, something okay, seems, me, I don't know. Let me give it to him. When I was first going in, he had a very long 
very, very comprehensive, very useful to me, just kind of playing catch up, TikTok of what had happened. And I, it didn't, it didn't seem to me particularly one way or the other. I mean, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, left, I, 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 I was, when I was okay. there, I would like, I would, I looked at his feed a couple of times just to see if there was any useful information and something struck me as well, off about it. I don't, I don't know. Exactly. I got a little hot under the collar the other day when they, um, you know, they set fire to this, this, it's a police union, I think over on 47th and Sandy on the East side. And he wrote, he's like, yeah, I know they did, but I mean, it's not like it's going to burn down the building. I'm like, dude, so what's the next step? Yeah. You think they're just going to make like a little fire every night for a hundred nights? We're going on night 85 next week, right? You write a little fire, you get some attention. Maybe you make a little bigger fire next time. What I'm the, so much what? less inclined now to have any grief for people who try to justify arson, especially given I, what I, it's happened in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I spent oh my God, that was over so terrifying. 10 days. I don't know if you saw anything. I did. No, you, everybody, you should go look at it. It was so heartbreaking. I'm just going to interrupt you one second. One thing that I try to do and I'll be going back to do is like, you got to sit with the individual people. Like I, I saw this in Kenton. Someone's commenting like, what are these business owners worried about? They have insurance. It's like, you know what? Like they've just gone through three months of COVID. They're totally broke. They're trying to better it. And it comes in and burnt down and you're like, they have insurance. Fuck you. Okay. You go. What if that's your parents? All yeah, right. So, and some of them don't even have insurance. And they don't have insurance because they can't afford it anymore. So the head of the business. And a lot of insurance doesn't cover no, rioting. Rioting, right? It's, it's not like, like a natural disaster or the, the more typical catastrophe that I, covered by insurance. I also think that people that say things like that. I mean, you, I'm actually, okay, that's another story. Uh, I mean, it can be the case that you're going to have someone that's 50 years old that's going to be like, oh, who cares? They have insurance. But mostly it's going to be people that really don't have to have insurance because they don't have anything, right? They don't understand that when you have children and, you know, you're trying to make things work, that when they burn down your building or even just smash your windows, that's $3,000. Yeah. Okay, like, yeah. Guys, like, and, there's, and, 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 and there's a, I mean, I, I'm still getting messages from people. There was somebody who sent me a message recently who works in some field that relates to construction, right? And they were saying that there's still a backlog in many parts of the country for replacement windows. And plywood. Like, and plywood, yeah. I mean, there was, there was, there, was, there, there in Minneapolis, St. Paul, I was there. Around a month after the the, the, the riot, the, the peak of the riots, and there were still people who couldn't get their orders placed to just replace their windows uh, that had been smashed. So, I mean, if you have your if your if your business is boarded up for like ninety days, do you think that's going to be enticing to customers? I mean, you're going to suffer economic damage that is uh, incidental to the initial act of destruction, um, which people don't recognize. I mean, and that. I'll never get over how in that initial first week or so after the George Floyd killing when the riots erupted where you had like pampered leftists, yeah, largely in their 20s and 30s, I guess. Like, oh, don't, don't cry any tears for these big corporate chains getting looted. It's just like, okay, maybe it's true that the corporate chains got looted and I'm not going to cry a tear for them. But then I go to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and actually see for myself, and guess what? When you're... When you have anarchy, you think people are just making very calculated, meticulous decisions about which establishment That's they right. target? No, oh, I will not bust that window. No, no. no I mean, because... there's like just random like brunch places and bars and things that got burned down. These aren't corporate chains, and so you, they're, they're, you're, if you if you if you're still making that argument to justify this, you're just you're just you're purposely ignorant of the, the reality. I think people, I mean, I would love it if everybody thought a little more, but also like, let's, let's st take a step back. Let's, you know, we've, we've been dealing with COVID since February, right? I mean, the pressures and stresses on people have been insane, whether it's, you know, unemployment or just cooped up with their families or just like, just, it's really messed people up. Right. And then like, you're finally getting out of it a little bit. And now you're dealing, well, you're dealing at the same time in Portland with these protests and now rioting 
every night. Mass, I, ga- mass gatherings every mass night. Gather- I, I really worry for like people's mental health, right? Like, you know, people are going to break. Well, Portland's and even, already a little bit of an insane asylum. And even, even the people doing it, like, you know, I understand, you know, we've all been like at a, I, I remember like losing my mind at a Portland Trailblazers basketball game because that feeling of just like, ah, you're so part of something. And I know that, especially young people, like they've been in their houses, they're outside now, like, ah, and it feels good. Like, what happens like the next day? Like, how do you feel? Then you go down and then you go up and then you go down. Like, this can't be good for anybody. Yeah, it's like, bi- it's like bipolar. City. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I worry about like, and then you had some guy apparently, I haven't read deeply into it, and I don't know if it's been four. I mean, just we'll... just from I mean, just to interject briefly. Yeah, you know, no, we're, please. We're, we keep interrupt, interrupting one another. Right. We've yeah, in the yeah, comments yeah, got annoyed yeah, by yeah. it, but sorry. But <laughs> our dispositions, I guess. Um, but, but I remember, like in uh, when I was involved journalistically in Occupy in 2011, so quite a while ago now. I could remember experiencing myself that phenomenon of going way up and then way down because there were times where Occupy felt like surreal. Yeah. In terms of how quickly it caught on and spread like wildfire, not just across the U.S., but across the world. Uh, it was kind of like a microcosm of what ended up happening with, with this. Uh, this, is, this has a lot more kind of establishment lead liberal support. Uh, but there was something, there was, like Occupy was in a way a precursor. Um, and you have like pretty much every night almost incredible scenes. At least for me, I hadn't experienced that before. And you know, from a mental health standpoint, uh, you know, I could see how, you know, it can almost make you feel like bipolar. If it, it made me feel like that in a way. And I wasn't, you know, in the in the midst of it in the way that a lot of people were. Um, so like I, I the, in other words, I can confirm that there is something to what you're what you're saying there, just in terms of how you experience the day-to-day uh routine of these major highs and then, and then lows like how does that finding an equilibrium subsequent to that is a, is challenging the first night i was there and it's in the first piece that i wrote for a reason um there was a little girl not little she was maybe 25 but she was tiny tiny little thing and she turns to her friend and she's like what what do we do if we do get in the building and i was like well yeah. i was like you know i don't I mean, just because I'm like, I feel like I'm old enough to be your mom. I'm like, oh, uh, I don't think that that's really the point. I think the point is like to do this. And, you know, I, and she was like, I think you're right. And you could just see how relieved she was that she didn't actually have to like take place in any sort of violence. Because I don't think most people really want to. You know, you've got an active yeah, yeah, yeah faction doing that. But I don't think most people really do want to be committing violence uh they may not they may not speak against it but i don't think they actually want to be doing it themselves i don't think yeah because i mean it's you're incurring a lot of personal risk potentially i mean well i think i I think what they do want is to uh, garner whatever kind of self-actualizing that's right purpose is available from simply just being there and taking part in this like collective effervescence to use a sociological term. Effervescence, people that is true. Look, people should look that up. If they that's true. Like, that's a, it's sort of what you get at like a concert or, or right. a Portland Trail, Trailblazers game, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It, like, it fulfills something that's pretty, a pretty deep need from like, the human psyche. Kind of epiphanic. Like you're just like, ah. Yeah, um, like, if, if, like if you're all like singing, I don't know, Hey Jude together or something. Like it's a, <laughs> you know, it's a, it, 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 it's a, you know, you can't get that alone, right? No, it's, you can't. You can't, and especially if you're it, if you've been atomized as a result of COVID for for months. Then right. you know, in a, in a way, that's why I don't like to individually. You know, if there's, I don't like to dwell on the individual on the individuals so much. I mean, sometimes it's useful to get their perspective, obviously, but but like, I'm not going to blame a 16 year old who like looted a Foot Locker, right? You know, too much because it's just like you know, all their friends are doing it. There's no cops around. His brain's not fully developed, so you yeah. know whatever. It, but, it, but it doesn't preclude me from that analyzing it in sort of totality. Uh, but, but before I forget, uh, you meant that going back to Kamala for a second. 
you said, I don't know how she's getting her information, because if you read the New York Times and CNN, this is pretty much how she portrayed Portland would be what you think is really happening. And yeah, I think it's a, that's sort of a crucial point, right? And I also think it gets to the strategic savvy of the, the protesters or the anarchists, like is like making making it so that and I, I and there was a senator from uh, Nevada, Jackie Rosen, who said, "Oh, it's in, in Portland. It's to, it's moms and veterans," and that was just a, 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 a an active strategic calculation on their part to make them the public face, sure. so that oh, like well, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I mean, so it was was pretty smart. I mean, they beguiled U.S. senators, so you know, and and the media. So I mean, you you have to wow. hand it to them in a way. Oh, absolutely. This was that's why I said when we were talking, like, uh, it's interesting to see, like, is this a bunch of like organized peaceful protesters sort of marching for what they believe in, and then you've got the hooligans over here that could be black bloc, antifa, whatever. There is some organization here, more than I thought when I first went in, the more I read, the more I see the things that they're trying to do, the more I see what the DA is introducing, the more I understand that, I, I, I mean, if Ted Wheeler gets reelected, uh, interesting. I think that there are people that have plans for the city and the oh, yeah. city, it's to, it's to just basically get rid of everything that they feel is a tool of oppression. Now. I don't know if they've really thought that through or like how they're going to actually make it work. Um, but for right now, they don't, they don't have to do that. They just have to keep fighting and, you know, being these warriors for justice. Uh, yeah. But I do think there is more planning and coordination than maybe a lot of people assume because in, in the chaotic scenario like that, it can seem like it's totally disorganized, but you know, if you pay attention, you can see people, like texting on their closed networks. They have like these walkie talkie radio yep. type systems set up that are undetectable, presumably by the authorities. And, you know, it, it, and clearly there's a political rationale and why they're keeping it going night after night that requires like people who actually have some organizational wherewithal, um, you know, and I'm fairly convinced. I talked about this on my stream last night, uh, with, this publisher of Zero Books, who also happens to live in Portland. Um, but uh, I, I do believe that in that initial phase of road pri uh, protests and riots, the insurrectionary rioting, the ideological rioting, was fomented by people who were coordinated. Not yeah, entirely, yes. but there was there yes. was active planning there. They they saw. I mean, it was like. Never let a crisis go to waste. The, the famous Rahm Emanuel line, which I think he took from somebody else. I can't remember who. It was probably a notable historical figure, and I look foolish for not recalling it. Um, but, like, the crisis, quote unquote, was the George Floyd killing. It was the spark, right? And then there was an opportunity there to instigate tremendously significant rioting that still resonating today. So, I mean, Absolutely. that's what, that's why I, I, I'm urging people to take their strategic uh savvy seriously i mean these are the most widespread riots since at least the 1960s and they're still going on you're absolutely right it was um they want this they've been priming the lo local government uh they've been you know kind of distancing themselves and 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 you know cutting the legs off from under the police um and george floyd obviously it exploded all over the country and the world um However, uh, Portland. It I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not just talking about Portland, by the way. I'm, ta no, I'm also talking no. about Minneapolis in particular, where you can, if you go there and talk to people who are involved, come away fairly convinced that there was an active insurrectionary Already. plan. Yes, yes. In that and early phase, anyway. I also, I mean, I, you know being at the building night after night after the peaceful protesters were gone and seeing what was going on. I, I do not, I know that they say that it's about black lives matter. It, it, it isn't. Um, it's about other objectives and they can roll black lives and in matter into it or black lives matter can roll, you know, what some of these people are doing into what they're doing, but it's, it's sort of different, 
different objectives, different sort of energies with a few overlapping objectives. And that is being done under the umbrella of Black Lives Matter is itself sort of ingenious, right? Because well, that, 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 gar that guarantees you're going to get this it, it, validation a, from normie Democrats and the media right. who find it, Black Lives Matter, whoever they can, whatever they conceive of that to be, they find it morally unimpeachable. That's right. It's an all access pass. Yeah, and requiring their active support and defense. And so, if you, so if you say, control, so, like, if you're an insurrectionary anarchist, you could just, you know, uh, that's right. Wield the banner of Black Lives Matter, and then you're pretty much guaranteed. Yeah, you get you get a, a get out of jail free card. And they are, uh, and I, you know, I have not spent a whole lot of time, if if any time, with the um, the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. I do know you have certain people in Portland that are like black leaders in Portland that are like, we don't like what you're doing has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter, you know, cut it out. But I don't think that that's the main sentiment necessarily. I mean, I would be pretty pissed if something somebody was taking what I built and using it to fuck shit up. I'd be like, stop it. But I, I, I haven't seen that that's the, the message yet. But I do wonder, I do wonder, um, I mean, people don't want to, people do not want to come out against the more radical, um, more violent parts of these protests because they, they fear being called a racist. They're very scared. They're, they're scared for their homes. They're scared for their businesses. They want to be supportive. And many of them are, if not most, if not all, are genuinely supportive. I mean, like, who is not for Black Lives Matter? This is like insane that you wouldn't yeah, be. That's why, because the, 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 the statement Black Lives Matter is almost like, yeah, like not banal in how obvious it is, right? But, uh, but when it becomes the, the rallying cry of a movement that, at least according to the New York Times, is the biggest protest movement in U.S. history, clearly that's going to become make it into like a nebulous concept that people can impart whenever they'd like onto it. And then, um, of course, but 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 this is this is people do this with everything, yeah, right? It's like I, I I just I'm gonna you're gonna have the you're going to have the the good ideas, and then you're gonna have the bad actors, and you're also going to have something I was gonna say earlier. I mean, this has been going on. We're going into night in the 80s at this point, and there was some guy, apparently a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL, who uh, walked into the crowd and threw some sorts of pipe bombs, which apparently did not actually explode. Thank God. Um, at people are like at the protesters at the, I don't know if it's at the peaceful protesters or if it was at the less peaceful protesters, but it was like, can you believe that this is like the most horrible thing? I'm like, well, actually I can believe it because if you're going to do this for 80 nights, you are going to start attracting people that are yahoos or more violent or, or hate you for whatever the reasons are. I mean, to think that no one is ever going to come out and oppose you is, yeah. and I'm not saying these people are legitimate in their opposition. I mean, I'm desperately happy that these bombs did not go off, but to think that it's not going to happen when you continually night after night, and again, not talking about the peaceful protesters, talking about the people beating shit up and breaking windows. It's like, yeah, someone's going to come after you. I'm you sort of, I'm sort of sick of the not talking about the peaceful protests. I know, it's throat clearing. Like, it is, it's throat clearing because like the whole reason why it's happening night after night is because of the more aggressive faction who are ensuring that it happens night after night. Like I, I, I don't think if like, if somehow it was it were possible to simply isolate the peaceful protesters, I don't think it would be on their accord that you have this nightly protest action. I think it is the more aggressive radicals who are saying, look, it's in our strategic interest to ensure that this is happening I, in perpetuity because that makes it possible that we can have a confrontation with the state and potentially even get another George Floyd moment that then oh sparks oh a national a nationwide thing, you know? Oh, I hope I'm just, so I was there um, the last night I was there last time. This was an, I mean, the, it was so insane in front of the federal building. There were not 200 people. There were two thousand people and there was this very high-tech light show going on and it was music and I was like it was a scene and there was a car kind of parked and all of a sudden this other car drives in and stops and then he goes to open his trunk I'm like oh no 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 my friend is like I am so out of here 
Turns out he's like giving this guy a jump in the middle of this insanity. But seriously, I was like, car bomb. Yeah, like I mean, it's someone you're going to get. I mean, if this and I, I hate, I didn't actually say this. Don't get any ideas, people. But how I think that what you're saying, I think that if this was all peaceful, it would kind of be chilling out now. It would be chilling out. People would start to work through more traditional channels, right? They would be working with, you know, daycare centers and on criminal justice with the new DA. And, and they would like say, it's been an exhausting spring. We've made strides. Our city is behind us. We're going to continue to make strides. I think that would happen in Portland because I think you also have that drive. But when you continually have this other thing where they don't want it to stop, whether it's the collective effervescence, it's the getting your yayas out, whether it's just how they do, you will start attracting, you will start attracting people that want to make a name for themselves or other weird uh, anti insurrectionists on the other side. It's not a good thing. Okay. These are the, how do these things start? Okay. How do these things get out of hand? I mean, I'm a little bit surprised that you haven't had more kind of counter protest or action that maybe could rise to the level of violence. Like why isn't, why haven't a group of guys from Eastern Oregon, you know, done a convoy to Portland or something, you know, I mean, it's, I, it's, it's not outside the realm of possibility. I just hope, I mean, it's just, it's like, it's just, it would just be such a bad scene. Like it wouldn't just, be that far of a drive. A bad... It wouldn't be that far of a drive for some the militias out there. I actually, no. I, I talked to some of some militia guys in Northern Idaho. Uh, on my trip, and yeah, but there are some. There, there are there are there are enough in, in Eastern Oregon, I and mean, that's part of what part of like the Proud Boys thing, I guess. That they, the militia sort of milieu, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in uh, the sort of last place that I went on my way home uh, this past weekend was uh, Louisville. Uh huh. Where there's still uh, a semi-active like encampment style thing uh, having to do with Brianna Taylor, which seems to yeah. be the most straightforward. Awful. Of the of the egregious police killings that happened recently, Awful. if you look into it, like there's pretty much no justification for it whatsoever. Nothing, and it's um, just well, have, I think I mean they they're they're stopping these no knock raids, correct? I mean, yeah, yeah, they I are, mean it, it, it's that that this woman had to die to inject some freaking sanity here. Yeah, <sighs> um, but you know, I, I heard from there's the, there's this Cuban restaurant in Louisville. Oh yeah, did you see that? I did. Where I did. You have this kind of group going around and making demands of individual business owners for them to put, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, pro Black Lives Matter declarations on their storefront windows and commit to like a set yeah. of demands. Yeah. And this Cuban business, owners, Cuban so restaurant no. owner, just like no. no. And now he's now he's in this like protracted I don't know feud or something. And I was getting messages from others. Um, I got a message from another. Business owner in Port, small business owner in Portland. Uh, it's not in Portland, in Louisville, who uh, who said that the same thing happened to him, but he was petrified of saying anything yeah, about it publicly because, like, why would you want that publicity, right? And so, I mean, it's uh, almost the, the the fact that these disputes haven't spilled out into more overt street violence is sort of amazing. Like you. you if it keeps going, I mean, if it seems like there's no end in sight, right, it seems at least plausible that at some point we're going to get something that happens. I, I mean, it would be lovely to think that it um, it can cool down. And it's interesting because I'm going back tomorrow and all your uh, people, they, as again, my, my DMs are open over on Twitter at Nancy Rom, N-A-N-C-Y-R-O-M-M, um, because I am... I do want to talk to people on like, I, I like talking to individual people. I like to, um, no, I do too. Of, I do too. Yeah. Too. Like tell, tell the bigger story through the, the little voices. Cause that's it. it it's like, this is hurting. Um, I had a guy, uh, a, a delivery food delivery driver message me and send me a video the other day. He's like, it's like midnight on a Saturday. He's like, well, yeah, I was gonna, I got to do a delivery over here, but guess I can't take this street cause it's on fire. And it's like, you know, he's out of work. He's trying to make some money to feed his family, but he can't. Like, that's also who this is hurting, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah well, that's, that's another crazy aspect to me, and people 
find it annoying that I dwell on this, but is that you think that because of the extremely protracted heightened attention on the pandemic on the part of the media, that if there was this, if there if there was nonstop action which completely like uh, contravened all this like everything about the societal compact that we had come to to mitigate the pandemic, that they might be a little bit more skeptical or a little bit more even adversarial toward it, given the, like, the underlying assumption of how curtailing the pandemic is supposed to be this paramount uh, priority for all of us. And yet you've seen almost none of that. In fact, no. you've seen this propagandistic insistence that somehow nightly mass gatherings, and in the earlier portion of this, like the, the biggest mass gatherings apparently in US history were totally like consistent with the pandemic mitigation practices that we had all signed on to for the preceding three and a half months or something. It's just insanity. And it, for that to just be, for that to just be accepted with nobody even in bothering to interrogate the inherent tensions, it just struck me as crazy, especially, you know, you know, this having been in New York, uh, you know, I'm in Jersey city, which is, you know, not quite the epicenter, but close enough where I actually said, you know, I'm going to do my societal duty here and pretty much lock down for six weeks. Yep. And then, you know, all of a sudden, it gets thrown out the window at a moment's notice and like nobody even bothers thinking about it too deeply. Well, it just drove me crazy. You've seen these messages that said it's more important. It's more important to fight these things. Um, that's, what whether, Ted Wheeler, that's what Ted Wheeler said. Yeah. Ted the Wheeler. Black Lives Matter okay. movement is more important. I am, uh, I am quite, well, I can't be quite sure. Pretty sure. Uh, Ted Wheeler is in a vice. V-I-S-E. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't see how he has a way out. Um, he can't, he, he can't. Could, he, he couldn't have said, uh, the pandemic is actually more important, right? They probably no. would have, oh, they, no, 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 there, no. there probably no. would have been like a pitchfork mob. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, it, you know, it, you'd be accused of racism and, you know, not, <laughs> not caring and, you know, just continuing, uh, to keep people in pain. Um, yeah, he, I don't, I don't see a way out for him. Um, especially when you're continually, you know, and I, I am not an expert on the Portland police department and I, I know some pretty terrible things that they've done. Not a lot. Um, but you know, they've had, they haven't, they've occasionally not covered themselves in glory. Um, but they also are pretty, I mean, I've never, ever, I mean, they're, they seem like pretty kind of good guys, but again, I'm not breaking the law. So I'm not, you know, I'm not their main target. Um, but Portland just wants at least the vocal ones now. Did you see the how much they want to defund the police by and the sheriff's department? Like fifty million dollars. Yeah. Defund this. Defund I mean, that, that. That gets to something that this person who I, I spoke to and quoted anonymously because yeah, yeah, he I, or she did yeah. not want to be associated yep. with this sentiment in public. But who's sort of like a left wing operative activist who's active in, in Portland and I'll just leave it at that. Um, but. They were telling me that, you know, <laughs> Portland is not, I mean, they were sort of contrasting the Portland Police Bureau, because it's actually called a bureau for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, P -P -P. with other departments in the United States that this person had, had experience with, which are much more, you know, oh. rife with corruption and violence, et cetera. So it's just like, actually, you know, given the reforms that the Portland Police Bureau has made over the past 25 years, we had in the 90s, a black chief who was appointed, who like sat, you know, uh, invited people to come to his house and, and talk to him uh, about how to improve the department. And they tried to like move to a community policing model and they diversified it. And they, you know, recruiting gay, you know, LGBT officers and uh, minorities, etc. They were saying, this is sort of a progressive person. They're saying, actually, this is kind of the model that you'd hope other departments could emulate. If we're gonna have police at all, I mean, it's not perfect, but this is sort of what we'd want to emulate. So for that, them now to be folded into this whole like jack booted thugs thing means that you're just getting to a full on police abolitionism yes. attitude, which if, is that, if that's your position, okay. But like, that's probably gonna be a minoritarian position. In the United I think States. the, you know, the Portland police department is reflective pretty much of the community. 
you know, that's, that's normal. That's natural. It's not like you've got, you know, I don't know, like the Stasi in there, right. You know, and versus the people of Portland, even though that that's how they're being portrayed. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the big question that my friends and I ask each other is what do they want? What do, what does the more radical element that continues to do this every night, what do they want? And, and the thing that I keep saying, and then again, I'm like, maybe I'm wrong. I know that they're very good at tearing shit down. That's what they do. I mean, they're pretty clear about what they want, right? They, they want the destruction of the constitutional order, right? I mean, okay. they feel it's in right? fashion. I mean, huh. it was so weird. I don't know. I, I, there was Bill Barr who did this interview a few nights ago on, on Fox with Mark Levin. And it's, it's, it's sad and depressing in a way because, like, Bill Barr always has – he's a smart guy. Like, he knows what he's talking about. He was sort of describing his perceptions of what Antifa wants. And he described it accurately. He described – what they say that they want, if you go and hear them speak and chant and what they write on their sign, which is the overthrow of the American constitution, the go governmental system, which they believe is inherently fascistic and racist and white supremacist and can't be reformed. I mean, it's not like they are bashful about proclaiming that as their ultimate ambition. So for Bill Barr, the attorney general, have a more rational take or to have a more like accurate, just pretty factually accurate take on what these people quote want than you're ever going to find in the lion's share of the media coverage is really to kind of it, it really illuminating disturbing. about them. It's disturbing about how fundamentally warped so much of the media is. And like, this is just a hallmark of the Trump era. And you can name a thousand other examples that also illustrate, including Russiagate, which Bill Barr also tends to have a much more rational take on, at least from my perspective, it's sort of a separate issue. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, just listen, if, if I can get a more accurate rendering of what's going on in Portland from Bill Barr than I can from the New York Wheeler. Times, oh, well, th then there, yeah. there's something there's something fundamentally well. Amiss. The thing that he the thing that he has wrong though is that it's some sort of you know nationalistic cabal that's coordinated, which it's not. I mean. My understanding is that nationalistic you know, meaning like meaning meaning na that you know nationwide it's like a yeah. nationwide you know it's like the Elks clubs all around the country and they well, they you didn't quite they have say that I mean it's no, worth listening to but like but, yeah I know what you mean um you know it's there is I guess you know there's some Antifa groups are more organized than others I think they are fairly organized in in Portland I don't know about in other cities but I don't know that they coordinate together. But okay, so let's accept that it's this. They want to tear all this stuff down. And we know that they're good at tearing down buildings and setting fires and, you know, graffiti and smashing stuff. Okay, kids. And, or, you know, canceling someone telling the telling the, the Louisville Cuban restaurant. I mean, I saw that list of demands, their manifesto, which was not just that you're going to, you know, buy 27% of your goods from black owned businesses. But it was the last part which like, oh, and if you don't do it, we're going to go on social media and do this. We're going to camp in front of your store. We're going to blah, 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 blah. Like, this is extortion, right? These are threats. All right, we know. We know, guys. Like, you're good. Like, instead of just going and opening your own Cuban restaurant, which nobody's stopping you from doing. Oh, I know. Yes, the system is maybe stopping you from doing it the way you want to present it. But, like, they want to just tear other people's stuff down. Okay, I get it. What are you going to build? I want to see you be able to build something because demo is easy. Demo super easy. Come over, Michael. We'll demo my kitchen, right? But we're it's going to be a lot harder for us to build a kitchen. And that's what, and I could be wrong, that's what I do not see happening in Portland. I do not see building. I see building of coalitions within Black Lives Matter, though then, of course, you get like, you know, the wall of moms, which implodes within nine days. So, you know, burn hot, burn fast. Um, what is being built by the more radical elements? Do they know how to build stuff? That's my question. Yeah, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily want to voice that obligation onto them because, you know, how what to, what to, what society to build is like a, big, a big question, right? And often one of the criticisms I get is like, oh, you just run around criticizing everything. You have you don't actually put forth an affirmative 
worldview, right? It's just, okay, that's not really what I perceive as my role. So like, right, maybe, maybe we need, maybe right. we need, well, I mean, I mean, I, I'm willing to say what I think should be done in select circumstances, but like, it's hard enough to accurately depict what's going on in the world, right? So for them, me to be required to fashion that into some kind of all encompassing treatise about how like American society should function, I think is a bit of a tall order. Um, so, so like, I, I don't know that I would want to necessarily you know, oblige them to, to any kind of freewheeling protest movement to necessarily have that at the ready in terms of like, what are they willing to build, right? I mean, if, they, if, if, if all they want to do is, I mean, it, maybe they just want to tear it down and then see what emerges from the ashes, right? I, I, mean, that's, I think that's what they're, I mean, for, from what I see, I think that's the plan. It's like, well, let's just burn it down or tear it down and, uh, and then we'll figure it out from there, which, okay. Uh, they might have some support there in the city. Uh, I have been wondering whether they were going to head over to City Hall. Uh, we'll see. I'll be there for a week on the ground. We'll see if that happens. Because I don't know that it's super satisfying for them just to go to this police union every night. Uh, it doesn't seem that sexy. So we'll see. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Any concluding thoughts here? Did we miss um, anything? Stop people complaining that I've been interrupting you, so I apologize. Oh, I, I, I'm interrupting you. I'm, we're, I'm a New Yorker. I interrupt everybody, and I'm sorry if I've been doing it. Um, lovely people. Okay, I've um, been, I'm from New Jersey, where I guess we have a cosmic entitlement to it up. Uh, I'm I'm just really fascinated to sort of see beyond the the two narratives and. Um, and bring it to you, the people, as best I can. So that's what I'm going to do. That's why I'll yes. be there. Be there this week. Yeah, and I, I, I'm interested. You know, why, why I you know, part of the reason why I titled this tongue in cheek uh, related to Kamala Harris is because I am interested in how these things get filtered into national narratives when uh, on the ground experience tends to make it clear to you that like the reality diverges from how it's being portrayed opportunistically by politicians like like Kamala who have certain needs in terms of making everything about how horrible Trump is or why Joe Biden should be elected president. I will I do want to say one other thing. I'm glad that you brought that up. I think that um, I think when a journalist uh, of any standing comes in and says like, oh, well, you know, it was, yeah, they set it on fire, but it's not like the building was going to catch fire. Um, I think that I, I understand how people's ideologies will color what they're doing. I think it's really dangerous. I think it's irresponsible and dangerous to, um, and I know people can't see past their own noses and I know that their organization wants them to, you know, like, I don't want that story. I want this story, Nancy. Well, I'm lucky to write for a reason. They want me to bring what I see, and I'm sure I have my own biases. But I think it's really dangerous. I think it's dangerous to not tell the truth as you see it and as it's told to you um, because it doesn't fit the narrative. I, I really do. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And, and it's been made so glaringly apparent to me over the course of this, the, the two month trip that I took in the aftermath of the riots, just how wide the gulf is between yeah. the media narratives and what yeah. the, the lived experiences for people who actually underwent the brunt of the destruction. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just pure propaganda. I mean, even if you feel like it's all ultimately justified in some abstract sense because of George right. Floyd or whatever, it's just okay, but then don't lie to us about what's actually happening. Let us be informed and then make the right. decision with right. all the information on the Exactly. Table. Right. I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm just going to tell you what's going on here and then you can you can decide. So, yeah. well, Michael, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Again, people follow uh, your, your work. I'll link to your, your Twitter and your, uh, your archive uh, if they're interested. And yeah, maybe we'll do it again sometime. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, everyone.